Good morning, family. It's me again, Pastor Peter Edward Matthews, pastor here at the historic McKinley United Methodist Church in the beautiful city of Dayton, Ohio. Today we bring you greetings from our Episcopal leader, the Right Reverend Gregory Von Palmer, our District Superintendent, Dr. Jocelyn Marie Roper, our church leaders, our friends, our community partners, all of us who are gathered all over the world for such a time as this. Uh, today we are mindful that we are just 44 days from the most consequential election, many people say, in the history of these United States. Consequential uh, because fires are raging throughout the West Coast. Racial unrest is still embroiled in the very fabric of our society. And we lost a lioness on yesterday, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so many people say that this is not the space or place to have conversations about politics. We would remind you of a theological word called incarnational. Uh, that means that those of us who love Jesus Christ are reminded that Jesus became one with not just uh, his self and his purposes, but also with the world. And there was an entangling of God's flesh that dwelt among all of us. Indeed, it requires us to get a little dirty. But right now, I ask you to maybe start a host party if you're on Facebook. Perhaps you're watching us on YouTube and you want to share this link with your friends, brothers, and sisters. However you do that, let's make sure that the next 80 some odd minutes is anchored in such a way that God gets the glory out of your soul's health and that you're nurtured and nourished through this encounter so that when you leave here, you'll be better than when you came. The first way we like to think about that each Sunday is to anchor ourselves in the discipline of stillness. Why? Because when there are so many things that are going on externally, we need to learn how to let go. Not just because that's a practice that we find in the Bible, we also need to let go for high blood pressure, hypertension, stress. And so here at McKinley, we invite you to practice now with us the discipline of stillness. How do you do that? Find a place. Perhaps you're in your bedroom. Uh, perhaps you're in your living room. Uh, perhaps you're in the breakfast nook, whether you're watching this on your television, on your smartphone, or on your tablet, wherever you are, just now place the other external apparatuses down and place your feet and plant it firmly on the ground. The, the placing of your feet on the ground is a reminder to yourself that the ground that you are on is holy ground. And I'm asking heartfelt that you consecrate that space for your glory. How do you consecrate that space? You place your feet firmly on the ground and merely begin to be still. Because in that stillness, we're asking God to be the lifter, not only of your head, but of your soul. The second thing I ask you to do is just to sit up just as straight as you can. You hear me say each week, all week long, there are external forces and persons that attempt to put a curvature in your spine and give their weight to you so that you feel so heavy you can't see the blessings that are in front of you. But check this out. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, your sins, my sins, have been forgiven. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. And I ask you now just to sit up just as straight as you can without guilt, fear, or shame and be present to the move of God that's about to enter into your mind, heart, and soul. Your feet are planted on holy ground. You're sitting up in response to God's grace. If you could just hold your hands out. The holding of your hands out is to remind you of the possibilities that are available to you when you have not just open hands, but an open soul. Not just an open soul, but an open heart. Not just an open heart, but an open mind. And as you're open now to those very real possibilities, your feet are on the ground planked. You're sitting straight up. Do this with me. In the spirit of the Trinity, let us take three long, slow, cleansing breaths. Let's start it together. Inhale. Exhale. Can we do two more together? Inhale. Exhale. One more time. Inhale. Exhale. And as your head is bowed as you continue to breathe slowly repeat these words after me I am free come on breathe with me I am free breathe I am free breathe and as you begin to find not just the rhythm of your breath, but the rhythm of God's spirit moving now freely in your soul, a dear friend of mine and a dear beloved brother and son of this church, <laughs> Professor Jeremy Winston, will now lead us in our centering moment. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded a whole. Sometimes I feel discouraged and I think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul.
you we thank you for reminding us that when we feel broken or defeated we thank you for reminding us that when all hope feels to have left our very existence that there is a bomb that patches our brokenness there is a bomb that etches the tapestry of grace upon our wounds and there is a bomb that has almost like invisible Kleenex that wipes tears from our eyes. And that balm in Gilead is a reminder that your promises are true because you promise never to leave us nor forsake us. And so God, we've gathered here on this morning from all over the world because if we have ever needed you before, we sure do need you right now. And so in your son's name, Jesus, we ask for the descension and the descending power of your Holy Spirit. Move now freely in this space called McKinley that we might touch smartphones and television screens and yea, God, even persons that they know that it is not over yet because you have not declared it so. It is not over yet because you have not decreed it so. And so come, usher us, and we'll be ever so careful, hallelujah, to give your name all honor and glory. Oh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children together said amen. Amen and amen. We, we now move in this portion of the service to my favorite part, actually. Uh, I, I like preaching, uh, but there's something uh, special, not about just the reading, but the telling of Scripture that not only gets us in line, oh, bless his name, with God's intentions for our lives, but it is a reminder of the African rights, R-I-T-E-S, that has brought us thus far. We are a storytelling people, and what a time it is that we see when Brother James has with God's word for such a time as this. Hear he him. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Continuing on in pastor's series of we hold these truths and we know that we hold these truths comes from the declaration of independence of these united states of america and it says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights and amongst these is life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and continuing on we know that he says and always says that Jesus was not a Democrat, a Republican, or an American. So I'm going to go again back to Jesus in the book of John, chapter 8, verses 29 to 36. And Jesus is in Jerusalem and around the temple, and he's speaking of his authority and of his witness. And we pick up here, and Jesus says... So he who has sent me is with me. And he has not left me alone. For I do always what pleases him. And many who, even as he spoke, many who heard him believed him. And then to the Jews who believed him, he said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. 
in the truth will set you free. But one of the Jews was like, we are descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. So how can you say that we will be set free? Jesus said, a slave sins. And a sinner is a slave to his sin. Jesus goes on to tell him, he says, and a slave doesn't have a permanent place in the family. But a son is in the house forever. Whom the son has set free will be free indeed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. November election approaches, many Ohioans are making sure their vote counts by registering. As part of our Dayton Gets Real initiative, News Center 7's Ronnell Hunt shares how the Ohio Unity Coalition Dayton is helping residents here in the Miami Valley. Also, some challenges the organization says the black community faces during this time. We are working with church vans and RTA to make sure if you need a ride to the poll during this COVID season, we want to make sure that you have a ride to the poll. Reverend Peter Matthews, pastor of McKinley United Methodist Church in Dayton, says his mission is simple. It's going to be more than who's on the ballot. It's going to be Baptists and Methodists and Church of God in Christ and Presbyterians and Seventh-day Adventists getting folks to help them wait in line, securing bus passes, making phone calls, and using our power to push the standard of history. The church is partnering with local leaders across our area through the Ohio Unity Coalition Dayton, an organization focused on making sure those in the black community have every opportunity to vote. We serve everybody, you know, but everybody's not equal, you know, and there are disparities in our community and people do recognize what they are, but our job is to make sure that those disparities are dealt with. Tom Maltzberry, president and CEO of United Way of Greater Dayton, says equality at the polls is something he's been fighting for a while. Voting is both a right and a privilege for us. And the reason I state that, Brandon, is because when it was a right, we did not have the privilege. You know, uh, we could not vote. You know, there was a time when, when black men couldn't vote and women couldn't vote at all. You know, and now we're past that time. and We can't take the, the sacrifices that people made for granted. Those sacrifices, Pastor Matthews also keeps in mind as he encourages people to get registered and vote on November 3rd. Grab back a power that we might equip another generation and make humanity human again. Yes, we can again! Ohio Unity Coalition Dayton will continue to host My Vote Matters talks every Wednesday leading up to election time at the McKinley United Methodist Church in Dayton. Ron L. Hunt, News Center 7.
Bleeding sound. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Wherever you are right now, whatever you're doing, if you find yourself in need of the Lord, why don't you just put your hands together? I know you might be Glory. watching on the tablet or on your, your cell phone. But if you're in need of God's grace or God's provision or God's peace, don't be ashamed to put your hands together. Don't be ashamed to say these three words. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you in my finances. I need you. I need you in my family. I need you. I need you at my job. I need you. I need you in our community. I need you. I need you. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. ashamed to say it. I know I got three degrees and working on another one, but I need you. I need you. I, I know that most of my bills are paid for the first time in a long time, but I need you. I need that the world seems so disjointed that if you live here in Dayton, you don't have to turn on the BBC to see the ravaged state in the devastations of poverty. You can just go up the street and see kids got dirty water. Um, if you are living here in Dayton, you don't have to turn on MSNBC or Fox News or CNN to see how our seniors who, without the opportunity to be present to church, are physiologically finding themselves shuddering because they are not uh, available to get the affirmation of the loves and the hugs that come with being in church. And so we stretch ourselves to you in a reminder, dear God, that we need you. And, and, and so we, we extend this space, this time in worship called offering because we're able to make the connection uh, y'all watch this now, between our need and God's provision. I, I wish y'all heard what I just said. That when I express my need, God, uh, not according to my righteousness, but because of God's grace, opens up the clouds and begins to dispatch real needs in real time for real people. Uh, uh, this week, I, I, I got a letter that I, I want to read and share with you. Uh, the letter says, Pastor Matthews, I just wanted to say hello and give you some encouragement. We are only now 92 tests away from your vision of meeting the 2000 test for the Dayton community. So in April, uh, McKinley United Methodist Church worked to test 220. In May, we did 99 tests. In June, we did 456 tests. In July, we tested 638 people. And in August, we tested 495 people. We were off 
on Labor Day, but last week we tested 25 people for a grand total of 1,908 tests. She says, I am certain that we will meet the goal as you have envisioned for us as we begin to wind down our efforts. Thank you all for all that you are doing to serve the residents of the city of Dayton. Blessings, Rhonda Croucher, Vice President, Community Engagement, Primary Health Solutions. And, you know, and so we ain't messing around. You, you see everybody here, we still wearing masks. We are still practicing social distancing. We are emphatically washing our hands uh, because we are still in the very midst of a very real pandemic. But if, if that weren't bad enough, um, there's a, a, a political pandemic that has literally now asked the, the society um, to push reset. And for many of us, it feels like 1776 all over again. Because in 44 days, you're not going to have a choice but to make a choice. Y'all don't hear what I said. <laughs> that you can no longer be neutral on the side of justice. And we're not here to tell you who to vote for. Uh, perhaps some of you saw that uh, WHO Channel 7 uh, left, uh, came by and offered an encouragement and a reminder for us uh, that we are working with uh, the Ohio Unity Coalition. And working with the Ohio Unity Coalition, there are more than 12 churches right now that are doing these four things with us. Uh, number one, uh, these churches are working phone banks with us. We are trying to secure that more than 35,000 people, likely voters, in the city of Dayton, Trotwood, and Jefferson County get called twice before the election to remind them to vote. The second thing that we're doing is a week from yesterday, we are employing 20 people to drop 23,000 pieces of literature. If you know someone that's looking for work, have them call the church at 937-228-1263. 937-228-1263. Uh, they're now working to that we're going to drop 22,000 pieces of literature in those same areas. The third thing uh, that we're working on is to make sure, to make sure now that every week you hear from one of our celebrated community civic activists. And so last week, uh, the county recorder, Brandon McLean, interviewed a wonderful man by the name of Thomas Maltzby, President CEO of uh, United Way. And so we had the president of United Way here that every Wednesday at 6.30, you not only hear a dynamic word from an area pastor, but you also have an opportunity to engage one of our civic icons uh, at the same time. And then the last thing, October 5th, we are going to make sure that if you need a ride to the poll, you can get here. You can get there. RTA just worked out an agreement with us where we are having now 500 bus passes. 500. That means that 500 people will have day passes. If you can't get to the polls, we're taking away all excuses of that. And unlike the video that you saw earlier in the worship service, that's not just about me, but that's about the team. Tremont, can you do me a favor? Uh, put the uh, camera on Jackie real quick. Now, bring it back this way. Now, Sister Jackie is not simply just playing for us on Sunday. She's also helping administrate all of those things that I just said. 
If you would look in her office, her office has been transposed to a headquarters to make sure that you and I get to the polls. This is not a one man or a one woman effort. We're asking you to wrap your arms around us to make sure that we vote. And doing that and still making sure that our seniors get food, uh, that our children in DeSoto Bass, Hilltop Community Projects up the street, more than 100 of them are still getting weekend dinner packages. All of these things that John Moore Center is doing in a reminder to the pastor and to the entire world that even though our doors are closed, our arms remain open. And, and so we need God's provision, but I need your help. I, I need your help. COVID testing, voter education, food for our children. We need real-time provision. And, and so I don't feel bad about asking because you have not because you ask not. Yeah. Right now, uh, if you're watching, uh, do yourself a favor. If you're still uh, writing out checks, uh, 196 Hawthorne Street, Dayton, Ohio, 45402. I, I wish you could see Brother James Clay. He's writing his check out right in front of me right now. Thank you, Brother James. I, I appreciate you seeding the revolution at McKinley United Methodist Church. What is that? Oh, I, I heard Anastasia, our millennial, on her phone, and she's right now at, what? Cash App. She said, go to Cash App. Thank you, Anastasia. She said, go to Cash App, dollar sign, McKinley UMC. If you are a PayPal person, Go to www.mckinleyumc.org. Go to www.mckinleyumc.org. And that first page will take you to that giving app. That's where our lay leader, uh, Charles Johnson, that's where he likes to give. And if you're, you don't want to step out and miss not one moment of this pretty face, stay on Facebook and simply click the charitable causes, click charitable causes and go to McKinley United Methodist Church. So you have one, two, three, four ways to make sure that God's provision continues to be planted and made manifest. We are humbled by the way people from around the world continue to give to help us give to others. But don't stop now. We need you now more than ever before. We're in this series of sermons now called We Hold These Truths to Be Self-Evident. We are mindful to reimagine patriotism because sometimes uh, you might have been born in this space, but based on the color of your skin, your identity, your sexuality, your income level, you felt anything but American. On yesterday, a lioness went home. Uh, this lioness had more than 27 plus years on the Supreme Court. She was the second female ever to do it. She left a track record of not only righting wrongs, but what I thought was so powerful, I heard uh, a person named John Meacham, an American historian, said she spent her life expanding and making available the rights for everyone. And so there's a, a, a portion of scripture that reminds us how emphatically she worked for gender equality. Uh, it's interesting to talk about gender equality in the church because 90% of what gets done in the church <laughs> gets done by women. And yet there's something encoded in our DNA, mine included, that objectifies or puts off 
those very persons who have granted us to be the, in the spaces that we are. So today, after having a conversation about race, after having a conversation about income inequality, today we want to visit a woman with an alabaster box and talk about gender equality. So in the spirit of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we can all say, we dissent. Can I 
have anybody here testify that there are some, if it hadn't been for some angels. Yes. <laughs> pray. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, allow it to be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And the children of God would say together, amen, amen, and amen. I, I hope this music is reaching you wherever you are like it's reaching us in this sanctuary. Um, there's a familiar portion of scripture that I, and I want to just take my time and read the whole thing. Uh, you get a chance, go to Mark, the gospel according to Mark, um, the 14th chapter. Uh, the gospel according to Mark, the 14th chapter comes right after the gospel according to Mark and the 13th chapter and right before the gospel according to Mark and the 15th chapter. I want to read um, from the common English version of the Bible. It was two days before Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and legal experts, Lord Jesus, through cunning tricks were searching for a way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But they agreed that it shouldn't happen during the festival lest there be a riot among the people. See, the people know. <laughs> but sometimes priests and legal experts get in the way. Uh, Jesus was at Bethany visiting the house of Simon who had a skin disease. Uh, during dinner, a woman uh, came with uh, a vase made of alabaster and containing some very expensive perfume of pure nard. Uh, she broke open the vase and poured... Mm, mm, mm the perfume on his head. Uh, some, because there's always some, right? Some grew angry. They said to each other, why waste this perfume? Uh, this perfume could have been sold for almost a year's pay and the money given to the poor. And they, scared of Jesus, scolded her. Listen, and they scolded her. Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. You will always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do something good for them, but you don't always have me. Now, I, 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 I'm not preaching this, but I, I want to talk about this. There's a lot of people, Emily, that have misinterpreted Jesus saying the poor will always be with you. Mm -hmm. Jesus was reminding the chief priests and legal experts and the difference and demonstrating the difference between justice and charity. He did not want his worship to be interrupted because people were trying to draw attention to their conscience. Oftentimes, Jesus was reminding the community of their obligations. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Jesus is not saying that poor people are supposed to be poor forever, but he is reminding the chief priests and legal experts of their civic responsibility. I, I, I can preach that a little later, but that's a, for another day. He says the poor will always be with you but you don't always have me. She has done what she could. 
She has anointed my body ahead of time for the burial. I will tell you the truth. Whenever in the whole world the good news is announced, what she has done will be told in memory of me. I want to talk about for a few moments, I dissent. I want to talk about for a few moments, I dissent. Um, If you are interested in the exemplary life uh, led by one Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, you have nothing to do but to perhaps go on YouTube and type any one of three things. Um, One, you can type Ruth Bader Ginsburg and YouTube will flood you with articles about how this uh, very brilliant woman became not only a legal scholar and later a legal uh, icon, but as she got older as a Supreme Court justice, she then became a pop cultural icon at the age of 87. You you could get that in there. Mm -hmm. Um, The the other thing is you could, she was so uh, prolific, you could go in YouTube or even Google search engine right now and simply put RBG and her initials would elicit the same thing. But what I loved to do is I loved her nickname. It was the notorious (laughs) R-B-G. I loved that nickname that was given to her by her justice and co-laborer, Sonia Sotomayor, um, because it is a reminder that you cannot always judge a book by its cover. And, And... I'm not here today, Lord have mercy, I'm not here today to offer her eulogy, just like I did not do the same thing when we lost another liberal icon by the name of John Lewis earlier this year. But there are some things from her life that make sense for me at this point in my own life and perhaps for yours. What is a little interesting to me in this uh, space uh, is not the more than 300 cases that she fought on behalf of uh, breaking down legal barriers for women in the 1970s single-handed. It's not the fact that she beat three spaces of cancer in her life as a Supreme Court justice or the fact that she did this without the love of her life and her husband of more than four decades by her side and he had been dead for 10 years. Uh, All of those things are interesting, but what is at stake, and I'm talking now to the brothers today, is where are you in your notion of gender equality? Uh, I'm asking that today uh, because there's a sense that some of us uh, try to treat our non-sexualized female friends like having a black friend. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Or a gay friend. You don't hear what I'm saying. And there is something about even the way we talk about women that has objectified them to the space that even while they're leading in our minds, we're considering them doing something else. You don't hear what I'm saying. And over and over and over again, it is in the walls of churches. It's in the classrooms in our schools. It is in the dormitories on college campuses. Over and over again, we continue to treat women like second class citizens. And there must be another revolution if we're going to unlock 
this Lord have mercy. This white supremacist gridlock that's on our nation. If we're going to change the world upside down and now right side up for Jesus, we must, Lord, I'm talking to myself, yeah. let loose 50% of the population. And time and time again, what we find that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was attempting to do is to craft the legal arguments to remind us as Americans that the boundaries of rights do not exist, not only for men, but there is something a simple and powerful about the Constitution that even in the beginning, denigrates our women and says we hold these truths to be yeah. self-evident that all yeah. we know better but we still haven't changed the language uh, uh, one of my favorite scholars is a woman by the name of Bell Hooks uh, I'm, I'm advertising Bell's book right now and one of the books that continues to work on my soul in times like these is called Feminism is for Everybody. Did you hear that, Jeremy? Feminism is for everybody. Did you hear that, Keith? Feminism is for everybody. Did you hear that, Charles? Feminism is for everybody. Passionate politics. Uh, Bell Hook says right off the bat, uh, she says, imagine living in a world where there is no domination, where females and males are not, uh, are not alike or even always equal, but where a vision of neutrality is the ethos shaping our interaction. Imagine living in a world where we can all be who we are, a world of peace and possibility. Feminist revolution alone will not create such a world. We need to end racism, class elitism, and imperialism, but it will take possible for us to be fully self-actualized females and males to create a beloved community, to live together, to realize our dreams of freedom and justice, living the truth that we are all really created equal. Now come closer. Today, she says, begin to read and see that feminism is not just for women, but it's also men for your daughters, your nieces, yeah. your mothers, and grandmothers. Um, I, I, it's it's mind-blowing to me that we have to continue to have this conversation. But I'm talking in front of men who have... have I, Guilty who have been talking to someone and your eyes go in the wrong direction. I I'm talking to men perhaps out there who want to have the right intention but still find themselves lost in this debate and we lose the savoring power of even having real dialogue for women because we treat them as other. And so I I I've got a solution. Um, even if as the laws are now beginning to create a more just society, even as some of us, Lord have mercy, are thinking about how we can right ourselves from our past wrongs, I have a standard bearer and a model that will allow us to think about reimagining not only our patriotism, but also how we deal and work with women. And his name is Jesus. Lord have mercy. Because time and time in the scripture, Jesus did not just make way for women. He demanded that their place was at the table and not in the kitchen. He demanded that their place was preaching the gospel and not just from a clerical sense, but to remind each and every woman that your voice matters and your voice not only matters to him, but it also matters to everyone else. And what we have to begin and think through now is that in this portion of scripture, in the gospel according to Mark in the 14th chapter, what we see is Jesus beginning to change 
the unjustness of a society and give us a glimpse, Lord, have mercy, of the beloved community. And if you know like I know, if you know anything about Jesus, if you've ever been blessed by the Lord, all you want is a glimpse that everything is going to be okay. Can I get a witness in this house today? Is there anybody here that can testify is that as long as God gave me a glimpse of his grace, a glimpse of his glory, a glimpse of his power, then after a while and soon and very soon. So, so in this story, we get a glimpse. And the glimpse comes because it's during the festival season. And, and, and these folk are, are tired. Now, remember who the folk are. Uh, uh, big time preachers <laughs> and politicians. Uh, I'm just saying what I'm saying. Uh, uh, big time preachers and politicians are tired of Jesus giving a glimpse of a beloved community. Uh, big time preachers and politicians are tired of Jesus letting the poor have a place at the table. Big time preachers and politicians are upset that the apple cart is now being turned upside down. But here's Jesus. And they said, hey man, this Jesus thing has gotten too far. I can't box him in as a Democrat. I, I can't box him in as a Republican. All he's doing is reminding folk that the kingdom is coming. All he's doing is healing people that didn't have any medical insurance. All he's doing is providing people who were poor with a voice and letting them know that the kingdom of God is within. We got to get rid of this guy, Jesus. No, not me, not me. I'm not the big time preacher. I, I, I'm saying in the Bible, in the Bible, in the Bible. And in the Bible we find, guess where they find him? They said, man, we got to put an end to this. If, 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 if poor people find out that their voice matters, we, we got to put an end to this. We, we got to do something different. We going we gonna to kill him. But let's kill him, no. After this season is over, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. So folk don't get too carried away. And, and guess where they found him? They found him, the Bible says, they found him in the house of a leper. Uh, someone that was unclean. Jesus was in the house of someone eating, relaxing, becoming incarnational with someone he ain't had no business being around. Uh -oh. If we're going to have to reimagine our patriotism, we're going to have to remember that we need to spend more time around folk we ain't got no business being around. We're going to need to spend less time in Bible study and more time at the bar reminding somebody that there's another kind of water that you'll never thirst again. And, and, and so they, 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 the Bible says, if you could, if I can use my sanctified imagination, the Bible says that they came up there and they was chilling. You know how men do. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You know how men do. And they was saying, and Charles is laughing, don't tell all your business, Charles. That's for after church. Uh, they, he was doing what men do they was reclining and chilling and yeah. Monday they, they, they was doing what men do and all of a sudden uh, there was a woman who would later uh, uh, find herself um, followed by Harriet Tubman there was a woman who later would find herself followed by Shirley Chisholm there was a woman who later would follow herself by, by Ruth Bader Ginsburg and my grandmama and my great-grandmama. This, this woman uh, who set the mark for dissenting. Uh, dissenting is to go contrary to popular opinion. Lord Jesus. Uh, uh, that, that the people would know that when you dissent, you were going against the grain. Yeah. This woman came in with the dissent and out of nowhere, the Bible says she had a box. Mm. Come on now. She had an alabaster box and she broke the box. Yeah. And started pouring it 
on the head of Jesus. And then that gets me really to my first point. If you're going to learn how to dissent, the first thing you do is you got to learn how to take a risk. So many of us live risk adverse lives and wonder why we never get anywhere. Because if you keep doing the same thing and expect a different result, that's the beginning of insanity. And so many of our churches were closed before COVID hit because they were risk averse. They were scared, y'all don't hear what I'm saying, scared to put poor people on the finance team. They were scared to put homeless people in charge of the buildings and ground crew. They were scared to put barren women in charge, Lord have mercy, of the youth ministry because they were scared to take a risk. But what I love about this unnamed woman is that her risk demonstrated courage. And I wonder if there are two or three people that I'm talking about this morning that are sick and tired of the status quo. They're sick and tired of being where they've always been and they're ready to take a risk because when you're ready to risk your lust, that's when you get love. When you risk your troubles, that's when Jesus learns to trust you. When you risk your drama, that's when you get delivered. Can I get a witness in this house? Because your risk implies courage. And what we learn from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, what we learn from women every day is that women demonstrate courage to go beyond the pale and remind us that our undreams are not yet met because we have not taken the next step and I wonder if there's someone here who's willing to take the next step on their job the next step on their family the next step on their business plan and break Lord have mercy break it open so she took that risk. She, she broke open that alabaster box. Yeah. And the Bible says that uh, it, uh, it, was like, it, it was like he was, the water was coming all over his head. And everybody was confused because it was like coming down from his side. And when you are used to living a status quo existence, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You don't have any courage to change. And so those big time preachers and politicians who had grown too accustomed to the status quo, they started scolding her and said, this could have been a year's worth of wages. Why has she behaved that way? And Jesus said, he scolded them back and looked and said, let her alone. And I want to tell some of the brothers who've got strong daughters who are good in math and science, let them alone. Let them lead. Let them serve. Let them come to the fullest part of their humanity. Stop asking them when they're going to get married. Stop I'm asking them when they're going to have children. Let them. He looked at her and said, let her alone. She has done what she could. To do what she could, she has broken this box for me and poured it on my head. She has begun a romance because after you take a risk, you need to have a romance and you got to get your mind right. A romance is not something that's sexual, but a romance demonstrates a commitment that she knew that she was entering into dangerous territory, but her love for Jesus was so full that she was willing to show a commitment to him. I wonder if there's anyone here that's got a real love affair with Jesus. Is there anybody here that's got a romance with the Lord that it doesn't matter where you are, you're not afraid to say thank you. That your romance does not depend to whether you're in church or out of church. You can be on your job. You can be in front of your enemies. But your romance is going to keep going. You're going to do what you can and raise those children. You're going to do what you can and create that business. You're going to do what you can and be committed and show that a romance can run from the crown of 
his head to the soles of his feet because you know that when you show off for God in public or as my mama says when the praises go up when the praises go up when the praises go up blessings so if you're willing to dissent you, you, you've got to be willing to risk and demonstrate some real courage. If you're willing to dissent, you've got to really have a romance that's not something that's sexualized, but it shows your commitment, your adoration to Jesus in perhaps dangerous spaces and places. But if we're really going to reimagine our patriotism and really deal with gender equality, we've got to be willing to reward people for the work that they do. Lord, have mercy. I'm going to my seat now, I promise. It, it says in verse 8, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body ahead of time. I tell you the truth. I love it. I tell you the truth. In the whole world, wherever the good news is announced, what she has done will be told in memory of me. I, I want to go quickly to my seat, but I want to end with this quote, what Bell Hook says. She says, what is and what is continually needed is a vision of masculinity where self-esteem and self-love does not destroy the basis of what it means to be female. Cultures of domination attack self-esteem, replacing it with the notion where we drive our sense to have to dominate one another. Patriarchal masculinity teaches men that their sense of identity, their sense of being, resides in their capacity to dominate. To change this, males must critique and challenge male domination of the planet of less powerful men and women. But they also have to have a dream and a vision of what that means to them. Uh, in other words, brothers got to be willing to give it up. If you see a bad sister that has nothing to do with how she looks, you've got to be willing to celebrate her and give her her roses. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Be willing to give her her roses before she goes on to be with the ancestors. Time and time again, we lose some of who we are because we don't have what it takes to celebrate the beauty of the accomplishments of the women that were right there. What does that mean? When I say reward, one second, when I, when I say reward, we've got to be willing to celebrate. Hear what I'm saying, that uh, a white woman makes about 68 cents on a dollar, that a black woman makes about 58 cents on a dollar, that a Hispanic woman makes about 38 cents on a dollar, that until we are able to celebrate and see women fully being equal on one accord, we need to do better because we know better. And that's what Jesus was doing at the end. He was willing to reward her by saying that wherever the gospel is preached, yeah. what she has done will be in remembrance of her. And so I, I know I'm a flail man. I've messed up in many relationships. But what I want to do is begin to get over myself and let brothers know that we have to risk our own patience Patriarchy. We've got to be willing to have romance affairs with women that are not simply sexualized objects and begin to reward them in real time. There's an old song that says, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry while others are calling. Do not pass, Lord have mercy, me by Savior, Savior. We dissent. Finished. Check this out. When Ruth Bader Ginsburg would be able and begin to write the dissent, there were sisters who were having a party just reading the legal brief. The dissent means that, Lord, I want y'all to hear this, 
is that she lost. But there was still a celebration that her voice, Lord have mercy, was going forward. I want you to know that we are in the process of changing the narrative relative to gender equality where there are not winners or losers, but there are spaces where they emerge. And, and so for brothers like myself who are crippled by their chauvinism and their misogyny and their sexism, we're on notice. We need today to recognize not just your daughter and your niece or your grandmother, but women like in Mark 14 who are unnamed and still ready to dissent because they weren't scared to take a risk and demonstrate courage. Real women that had a romance with their professions and their gifts given to them by God and demonstrated that commitment to the end. And, and, and real women that we can reward and celebrate in real time. I, I'm going to say this. I, I really am done now. Uh, yesterday, I, I, a friend of mine from high school that I've only seen twice in 25 years, um, we were here eating lunch, and he started talking about my mama. Now, my mother and I have an interesting relationship. I love her. She loves me. But we, we go at it, and we love each other. But he reminded me of several stories of when he was in high school about how my mother got him together. Man, I forgot. I didn't know. I forgot all about that because I had locked my mother in the box of only being my mother and not having the capacity to be that which she could for other people. And then it hit me. Then we started talking about um, how he would come over. Then I had another friend that would come over. We went to this little private school and I had three or four friends that would come over. Now, <laughs> I ain't never asked my mama could they come over. I ain't never asked my mother was there enough food. I never asked her how much the water bill was. Right? She was exceeding that box right there. And that doesn't diminish our back and forth, but it reminded me that men are surrounded by women that we capture in these little boxes, never knowing that they're living courageous lives all around us. And so today when I open up the doors of the church, I express not just the love to the women who I have sometimes tormented and sometimes upset, but I express that same love to Jesus for working me through my own stuff. Mm. Men, today, the door is open for you. The door is open for us. The door is open for humanity. If you do not have an active and intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ for yourself, my loving and beautiful daughter, Emily, is right there waiting to talk to you about Jesus right now check her out online if you are looking for a church home a church home that's trying to get it right that recognizes our failures our moral limitations and you want to be involved in something bigger than you could ever imagine we would love to even be your virtual church home right now simply go online and Emily will show you more about that relationship as we get ready for our new members class this coming Saturday. And last but not least, if you got a dream, a big dream, we want to help you put that dream together. One of my dearest friends, a brother named Keith on the drums, does more than simply keep us on beat. He is one of the most prolific small business minds in the city of Dayton, and him and I want to help you write that business plan. So if you're looking for a church home, looking to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, looking to start that dream, your time is now. As you're thinking about that, 
I want to share my favorite song with you. powerful word from my pastor and such beautiful music again. Hello, my name is Charles Johnson Sr. and I'm the lay leader here at the historic McKinley United Methodist Church. Indeed, this election is the most important for persons of all genders, races, income levels, nationalities, sexual orientations to vote. If you are eligible, and are not already registered to vote, you must register to vote. Here are a few announcements. Join Pastor right here this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. with the Ohio Unity Coalition and a very special guest. Josh Ward from Omega Baptist Church here in Dayton, and that's Wednesday, September 23rd, 2020, here on Facebook and YouTube Live at 6.30 for a, for a special praise service. And don't forget, that's right, another COVID-19 testing that we're doing, this time will be at St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church at 2262 North Gettysburg Avenue, Dayton, Ohio, 
45406. That will be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So come on out and get tested. Don't forget, either follow us or like us at McKinley UMC on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, or Twitter. And finally, if you haven't had an opportunity to join us as we, pro as we provide extensional services for our seniors or provide school supplies for children in the Soda Bass and Hilltop areas, or assist in the COVID testing of more than 1,800 plus persons so far. And as of tomorrow, 16 locations. Please consider offering a charitable and tax deductible donation by sending a check to 196 Hawthorne Street, Dayton, Ohio, 45402. That's 196 Hawthorne Street, Dayton, Ohio, 45402. Or by giving on Cash App with dollar sign McKinley UMC. Or by logging on to our website at www.mckinleyumc.org and clicking on the give to use PayPal. Or you can give on Facebook at Charitable Causes under McKinley UMC. Thanks again. See you again. See you next time. Same week, same place. Hey, Amen. Uh, as we close out, uh, we ask that you continue to keep us in prayer. We held you for a couple extra minutes today, but I, I got a little carried away. Please uh, be mindful of that we've got 44 days. If you know somebody that's not uh, registered, it's your responsibility to make sure that they register to vote because the future of our daughters, the future of our nieces, grandmothers and mothers depend on it. And so this week, make sure you put yourself in some risk, risky situations that allow you to demonstrate godly courage. Make sure you identify a romance that's not sexualized, but rather demonstrates your full-throated commitment to what it means to being a follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then be willing to reward or celebrate some sisters, not because of what they can do for you, but because God has gifted them so. If we're going to go against the majority, we've got to be different ourselves. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each of us both now and forever. Let the church say amen, amen, and amen. I, I want to make y'all laugh before y'all leave. Um, uh, Jackie literally played the keyboard till it broke. She literally just played the hell out of the keyboard. See y'all next week.